Section 11 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett Part 11 of Enchantress of Venus The island was shrouded heavily in mist and the blue darkness of the night. Stark and Treon crept silently among the rocks until they could see the glimmer of torchlight through the window slits of the power station. There were seven guards, five inside the blockhouse, two outside to patrol. When they were close enough, Stark slipped away, going like a shadow, and never a pebble turned under his bare foot. Presently he found a spot to his liking and crouched down. A sentry went by not three feet away, yawning and looking hopefully at the sky for the first signs of dawn. Treon's voice rang out, the sweet, unmistakable voice. "'Ho there, guards!' The sentry stopped and whirled around. Off around the curve of the stone wall, someone began to run, his sandals thud-thudding on the soft ground, and the second guard came up. "'Who speaks?' one demanded. "'The Lord Treon?' They peered into the darkness, and Treon answered, "'Yes.' He had come forward far enough so that they could make out the pale blur of his face, keeping his body out of sight among the rocks and the shrubs that sprang up between them. "'Make haste,' he ordered. "'Bid them open the door, there.' He spoke in breathless jerks, as though spent. "'A tragedy! A disaster! Bid them open them!' One of the men leaped to obey, hammering on the massive door that was kept barred from the inside. The other stood, goggle-eyed, watching. Then the door opened, spilling a flood of yellow torchlight into the red fog. "'What is it?' cried the men inside. "'What has happened?' "'Come out!' gasped Treon. "'My cousin is dead. The Lord Egil is dead, murdered by a slave.' He let that sink in. Three or more men came outside into the circle of light, and their faces were frightened, as though somehow they feared they might be held responsible for this thing. "'You know him,' said Treon. "'The great black-haired one from Earth. He has slain the Lord Egil and got away into the forest.' and we need all extra guards to go after him, since many must be left to guard the other slaves, who are mutinous. You, and you. He picked out the four biggest ones. Go at once and join the search. I will stay here with the others. It nearly worked. The four took a hesitant step or two, and then one paused and said doubtfully, But, my lord, it is forbidden that we leave our posts for any reason. "'Any reason at all, my lord? "'The Lord Cond would slay us if we left this place.' "'And you fear the Lord Cond more than you do me,' said Treon, philosophically. "'Ah, well, I understand.' He stepped out, full into the light. A gasp went up, and then a startled yell. The three men from inside had come out armed only with swords, but the two sentries had their shock weapons. One of them shrieked. "'It's a demon who speaks with Treon's voice.' And the two black weapons started up. Behind them, Stark fired two silent bolts in quick succession. The men fell, safely out of the way for hours. Then he leapt for the door. He collided with two men who were doing the same thing. The third had turned to hold Treon off with his sword until they were safely inside. Seeing that Treon, who was unarmed, was in danger of being spitted on the man's point. Stark fired between the two lunging bodies as he fell, and brought the guard down. Then he was involved in a thrashing tangle of arms and legs, and a lucky blow jarred the shock weapon out of his hand. Treon added himself to the fray. Pleasuring in his new strength, he caught one man by the neck and pulled him off. The guards were big men and powerful, and they fought desperately. Stark was bruised and bleeding from a cut mouth before he could get in a finishing blow. Someone rushed past him into the doorway. Treon yelled. Out of the tail of his eyes, Stark saw the Lahari sitting dazed on the ground. The door was closing. Stark hunched up his shoulders and sprang. He hit the heavy panel with a jar that nearly knocked him breathless. It slammed open, and there was a cry of pain and the sound of someone falling. Stark burst through, to
to find the last of the guards rolling every which way over the floor. But one rolled over onto his feet again, drawing his sword as he rose. He had not had time before. Stark continued his rush without stopping. He plunged headlong into the man before the point was clear of the scabbard, bore him over and down, and finished the man off with a savage efficiency. He leaped to his feet, breathing hard, spitting blood out of his mouth, and looked around the control room. But the others had fled, obviously to raise the warning. The mechanism was simple. It contained a large black metal oblong about the size and shape of a coffin, equipped with grids and lenses and dials. It hummed softly to itself, but what its source of power was, Stark did not know. Perhaps those same cosmic rays harnessed to a different use. He closed what seemed to be a master switch, and the humming stopped, and the flickering light died out of the lenses. He picked up the slain guard's sword and carefully wrecked everything that was breakable. Then he went outside again. Treon was standing up, shaking his head. He smiled ruefully. It seems that strength alone is not enough, he said. One must have skill as well. The barriers are down, said Stark. The way is clear. Treon nodded and went with him back into the sea. This time both carried shock weapons taken from the guards, six in all, with eagles. Total armament for war. As they forged swiftly through the red depths, Stark asked, What of the people of Sharud? How will they fight? Treon answered, Those of Malthor's breed will stand for the Lahari. They must, for all their hope is there. The others will wait until they see which side is safest. They would rise against the Lahari if they dared, for we have brought them only fear in their lifetimes. But they will wait and see. Stark nodded. He did not speak again. They passed over the brooding city, and Stark thought of Egil and of Malthor, who were part of that silence now, drifting slowly through the empty streets where the little currents took them, wrapped in their shrouds of dim fire. He thought of Zareth sleeping in the Hall of Kings, and his eyes held a cold, cruel light. They swooped down over the slave barracks. Treon remained on watch outside. Stark went in, taking with him the extra weapons. The slaves still slept. Some of them dreamed, and moaned in their dreaming, and others might have been dead, with their hollow faces white as skulls. Slaves! one hundred and four, counting the women. Stark shouted out to them, and they woke, starting up on their pallets, their eyes full of terror. Then they saw who it was that called them, standing collarless and armed, and there was a great surging and a clamor that stilled as Stark shouted again, demanding silence. This time Helvi's voice echoed his. The tall barbarian had awakened from his drugged sleep. Stark told them, very briefly, all that had happened. "'You are freed from the collar,' he said. "'This day you can survive or die as men, and not slaves.' He paused, then asked, "'Who will go with me into Sharoon?' They answered with one voice, the voice of the Lost Ones, who saw the red pall of death begin to lift from over them. The Lost Ones, who had found hope again— Stark laughed. He was happy. He gave the extra weapons to Helvey and three others that he chose, and Helvey looked into his eyes and laughed too. Treon spoke from the open door. They are coming. Stark gave Helvey quick instructions and darted out, taking with him one of the other men. With Treon, they hid among the shrubbery of the garden that was outside the hall, patterned and beautiful, swaying its lifeless brilliance in the lazy drifts of fire. The guards came, twenty of them, tall armed men, to turn out the slaves for another period of labor, dragging the useless stones. And the hidden weapons spoke with their silent tongues. Eight of the guards fell inside the hall. Nine of them went down outside. Ten of the slaves died with blazing collars before the remaining three were overcome. 
Now there were twenty swords among ninety-four slaves, counting the women. They left the city and rose up over the dreaming forest, a flight of white ghosts with flames in their hair, coming back from the red dusk and the silence to find the light again. Light and vengeance. The first pale glimmer of dawn was sifting through the clouds as they came up among the rocks below the castle of the Lahari. Stark left them and went like a shadow up the tumbled cliffs to where he had hidden his gun on the night he had first come to Sharoon. Nothing stirred. The fog lifted up from the sea like a vapor of blood, and the face of Venus was still dark. Only the clouds were touched with pearl. Stark returned to the others. He gave one of his shock weapons to a swamplander with a cold madness in his eyes. Then he spoke a few final words to Helvi and went back with Treon under the surface of the sea. Treon led the way. He went along the face of the submerged cliff, and presently he touched Stark's arm and pointed to where a round mouth opened in the rock. It was made long ago, said Treon, so that the Lahari and their slaves might come and go and not be seen. Come, and be very quiet. They swam into the tunnel mouth and down the dark way that lay beyond, until the lift of the floor brought them out of the sea. Then they felt their way silently along, stopping now and again to listen. Surprise was their only hope. Treon had said that with the two of them they might succeed. More men would surely be discovered, and meet a swift end at the hands of the guards. Stark hoped Treon was right. They came to a blank wall of dressed stone. Treon leaned his weight against one side, and a great block swung slowly around on a central pivot. Guttering torchlight came through the crack. By it, Stark could see that the room beyond was empty. They stepped through, and as they did so, a servant in bright silks came yawning into the room with a fresh torch to replace the one that was dying. He stopped in mid-step his eyes widening. He dropped the torch. His mouth opened to shape a scream, but no sound came, and Stark remembered that these servants were tongueless, to prevent them from telling what they saw or heard in the castle, Treon said. The man spun about and fled, down a long, dim-lit hall. Stark ran him down without effort. He struck once with the barrel of his gun, and the man fell and was still. Treon came up. His face had a look almost of exaltation, a queer shining of the eyes that made Stark shiver. He led on, through a series of empty rooms, all somber black, and they met no one else for a while. He stopped at last before a small door of burnished gold. He looked at Stark once, and nodded, and thrust the panels open and stepped through. End of Section 11